What is going on guys? I am so excited. I think last night was our last frost of the year. Um, tonight's forecast, the low is 48, I believe, and then the rest of the week is like in the high 40s and 50s, and I'm so excited. I'm going to be planting seeds today, so sowing some cucumbers and beans in the garden, and then I'm also going to plant out a couple tomato plants. Now, I'm not planning out the whole garden right now. <laughs> I'm still scared a little bit of the weather and if it may dip back down. So I live in the county and in my town where you know the weather forecast comes from, I usually run between five and 10 degrees colder than the forecast. So if it dips into the low 40s on the forecast anytime in this next week, uh, I'm expecting it to get pretty cold here. Not necessarily freezing, but I'm just planting out about four test tomatoes and we're gonna see how it goes. So before we head outside, I wanted to show you guys what I was going to be sowing in the garden. So I have four, technically five, but four available trellis areas for beans in my garden. And the three types of beans that are all climbing beans are going to be planted on those bowed trellises. And then on the fourth trellis with the new beds that I planted this year, I'm going to be doing Tromboncino squash. Now the three types of beans that I have are a rattlesnake pole bean, a green asparagus bean. These are pretty cool. They get like two feet long and they're really great as like a green bean that you would saute. Not so good as a dried bean. And then also doing purple hole pink eye cow peas. Cow peas are also called southern peas, Crowder peas, field peas, or black eyed peas. <laughs> they're most commonly used as dried beans as you would see black eyed peas used. But they're amazing fresh as well. I've never tried this variety. I've only tried, I don't remember the name of the vining cow pea variety I've had before. But they're excellent either fresh or dried. And I'm very excited to try these. Now for my cucumbers, I just realized that I wanted this Armenian cucumber on a trellis and I only have four spaces available. So I might forego the Tromboncino squash on my last trellis and plant this Armenian cucumber on the last trellis. I think that's what's gonna happen. Because in my 10 foot long bed, I have a smaller cattle panel that I will just put up diagonally in the corner and I will grow this hybrid cucumber thunder. This is a hybrid variety from Johnny Seeds. It's supposed to be a little bit more heat tolerant than other varieties, which is really necessary in the spring here in Southern New Mexico. And cucumbers tend to really flail in high heat above you know, 90, 95, which is our regular daytime temperatures in April. So we're gonna get outside and sow all of these beans and I'll show you how I Try to do that as best as possible to avoid the heat and dryness of the desert. But first, I wanted to say thank you guys to everyone who responded on my last video about the cutworms and show you my front yard landscaping. So I usually have the same pests here every year. I have squash bugs. I have a terrible issue with cabbage moths and cabbage worms, also tomato horn the tomato hornworms, and what is the name of that thing? Oh, leaf miners. I have leaf miners every year. They're worse in spring and then during our monsoon season. But I have never had to look up what a cutworm was or what it did. And then when I had several people comment on my last video on my beheaded seedlings, cutworms, and by golly, I think that was it. <laughs> so cutworms are just a basic catch-all for a type of grub. And you know, you know what grub worms look like, I'm sure. They crawl along the ground. They bed really well in deep mulch, which is all this is right here. <laughs> um, so I looked up ways to deal with it and I was actually offered a couple solutions by you guys as well. But one way that I found that seemed doable on a large scale because I had so many squash plants was aluminum foil around the stem. So here on this squash plant, I just made a little collar essentially of aluminum foil to protect the bottom where the grub would normally crawl up and 
you know, slice its head off. And the aluminum foil idea appealed to me the most because this is really malleable and easy to make any shape I want out of it. And I planted out several squash plants last night in the front yard garden and none of them are beheaded. I think that was it. I also put diatomaceous earth around the bottom. This is a common garden amendment, super cheap. You can find it at Tractor Supply. I don't remember how much it is. I wanna say it's around $20, but I'm still running off of the 25 pound bag I bought three years ago, and it's not even a quarter of the way gone. <laughs> this stuff has lasted me forever. And although it won't kill the grub worms or insects, immediately upon contact. It will help deter them and over time, if they keep coming back to that area, it will likely damage them severely or kill them. So that along with the um, aluminum foil was just an extra measure. And I have had complete success over one night. And I just wanted to thank every single one of you who responded. That was extremely helpful. I was so lost on what it could have been. So now I know that I am dealing with cutworms here too. Boo. <laughs> so I'm here next to my second trellis of the garden. And what I have here is a bag of compost. Now this is just a Wakefield premium compost. It's organic, OMRI certified. My mom bought this for me. I've never used it before this year, but I had really good success with it in the soil blocks. So I'm just gonna use up the rest of this bag. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of homemade compost left after I amended all of my garden beds. But let me show you what the soil looks like underneath the mulch that I've had on this bed for the winter. So this entire garden bed has already been amended with my homemade compost. And then I just recovered it with the straw mulch that I had on it before. Now the soil in the bed is a little bit lower than I would like, but part of that's gonna be helped with the compost. Now when I pull all this mulch back, this soil is extremely dry and it's probably most likely a little hydrophobic. Obviously we don't get a lot of rain here and I'm not going to just randomly put water in my bed to keep the soil moist all winter. That's not feasible for me. So what I'm going to do, um, because this soil is probably hydrophobic, which means it's just going to resist water and it's not going to really suction up the water like it should. I'm gonna put a top layer of compost over this soil and then I'm going to plant my seeds in that because this fresh compost has more humus in it. It hasn't been dry for several months and it will just hold moisture better so that these stay, seeds can stay moist while they germinate. Now, if you don't have compost, that's not a deal breaker. You can also just use regular bagged soil, which I might end up using if I run out of this before I get all of my beds done. But the general point when sowing seeds in a desert environment or desert soil or sandy soil is that you need to add organic matter back so that this really dry soil doesn't just evaporate all of the water every time you water it. The main issue with trying to germinate seeds here is that the soil just will not stay moist. And even if you water in the morning, if it's a 90, 100 degree day, by the end of the day, that top inch of soil will be dried out. Worst comes to worst, your seeds won't germinate at all or they will germinate slightly and dry out and then die. So just adding a little something here to the top that the seeds can sit in for the time being until they get roots established is greatly beneficial. Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna have enough of this compost to make it last for all four beds. Now an issue that I've had quite commonly in the past is trying to plant these seeds too close to the edge of the bed. So I'm gonna bring them back about to here and plant them here because they'll grow up enough and then I can start trellising them on the fence. But the problem with planting them too close to the bed is that once you water this area, the water's gonna have a tendency to just cling to the bed and run all the way down. And this couple inches right on the edge of the bed actually dries out quicker than <laughs> over here. So in the past, I planted a lot of seeds way too close and the seedlings just struggle and struggle and then finally die because the location they're placed isn't actually retaining any water and the water's just running out the side of the bed and then the soil becomes hydrophobic and then they never receive water. 
So I will be planting these a little bit further in towards the edge of the bed this year as well. Let's see how that works. So the bean I'm gonna be seeding in this bed is the rattlesnake pole bean. The reason I'm choosing this one on the east side of the garden is because it struggled a little bit in the heat last summer. So it produced plenty of greens. It grew the entire summer, but it didn't actually set any beans, any fruit until I want to say like mid August, like halfway through the monsoon season. And I don't want that to happen again. Of course it's pretty, it still grows, but I do actually want it to produce me food. So I'm hoping if it's on the east side of the garden, it's gonna have a lot of foliage from other plants blocking that afternoon sun. And maybe it will do a bit better than it did last year. Now just because this is compost doesn't mean it's gonna magically stay moist if I leave it uncovered. <laughs> I do have to cover this back up with mulch. Now I will not be using the entire like three inches of mulch that I have here, but you also don't have to worry about covering up your seeds unless they're very, very, very tiny, thin, fragile seedlings coming up, which beans are not. You do not have to worry about covering them with a light layer of mulch. Their leaves will absolutely push up through to find the sunlight. That is what they are built for. That's what they want to do. So you do not have to leave your dirt uncovered in the expectation of a seedling bursting through the top. It's not necessary. I have planted like this many, many times over and it is always more beneficial to have mulch over that bare earth than needlessly worrying about the seedling not being able to reach the light. So I am, like I said, just doing a light layer here, enough to keep the soil covered and out of the beating sun that we have right now. And that's a piece of trash. The only mulch you do want to shy away from is something that mats pretty well, like a heavy layer of pine straw or pine needles or even like a medium layer of wet grass that tends to mat together and that possibly will form an impenetrable barrier that the seedling can't reach up through. Like I said, that's what they're made for. They push through the dirt to get up. They can push away a little bit of straw, but just be wary of using thick matting mulch that actually may do what you're trying not to do. And this side of this bed is done. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more areas to plant. And in these two beds, I am putting beans. This last row is gonna be my most heat tolerant bean, the asparagus bean. And then here I will put, well actually, both the asparagus bean and the cow peas are great. They're very heat tolerant. So I'm not sure what I'm doing here. But on these far east beds, the brand new ones I built, we still have not put up the cattle panel. It's sitting right there. Um, but I'm going to put the Armenian cucumber on this trellis. I am going to plant these beans and get back to you guys in a hot second. Alright guys, so I have finished, but I left two beds alone. I didn't plant anything in them. The first is this onion bed. Um, when these onions come to fruition, if they do, I will be planting Armenian cucumbers on this side. For now, they'll just start over there. And then the same is for this garlic bed back here. So I planted asparagus beans on this trellis. And I'm gonna leave this be until I harvest the garlic in about a month or two, and then I will plant more asparagus beans on this side. Now, both the asparagus beans and the Armenian cucumber are heat tolerant varieties of their respective plants. So I'm not worried about sowing them, you know, mid spring, early summer. That shouldn't be an issue at all. That's why I chose this bed, this last bed for the asparagus beans. They were in this last trellis last year, which is receives like all of the Western sun. <laughs> it is, these two beds are the hottest beds that I have during the day in the summertime. So I'm not worried about planting the asparagus beans here late. But that's it guys, that is how 
I sow my seeds directly into my hot desert soil. <laughs> Uh, thank you for joining me. I will get back with you guys to plant the garden and all of my transplants soon. For now, my camera's about to die. I'm going to lose you. <laughs> I'll catch you on the next one.